Thanks, Carissa. Hi, everyone. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Um, definitely uh, sort of doing this work. Um, really grateful for this opportunity. It's clear a ton of um, intentionality went into sort of scoping out the need for this um, sort of RFP. And I can say, uh, I think everyone here can say that's not something you can sort of take for granted. So um, I guess I'll start actually by saying, um, I mean, Lori and Kimberly, like congrats on the program you built. Uh, I'm someone in recovery, I'm up here myself. There's definitely, um, you know, something we should talk about partnering, but um, just for the next 10 minutes, I'll give a kind of brief overview of Marigold. I'll try to keep it high level um, because I want to make sure we leave time for Q&A. So I will start by attempting to share my screen. Uh, you guys can let me know when it is popping up on your end. Yep, all good. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm Trenick. I'm the founder and CEO of Marigold Health. I'm here with Chris, our partnerships manager. You'll probably see him in the chat and he'll keep track of the follow-ups. So Marigold, as we've mentioned, is a um, digital peer support provider. Um, basically, the way to think about us is we train a workforce of people who have lived experience uh, with recovery from a mental health or substance use condition to support others. And the primary means we deliver support is through these 24-7 chat groups not because our program is hyper-focused on those chat groups. We actually do send peers out to the community. We do lots of face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one supports, but because most members actually end up engaging uh, in the group format when they won't actually engage with other supports more one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, so in terms of just briefly uh, some sort of level setting in terms of my personal background. So I started Marigold about five years ago um, with the team out of Johns Hopkins. Um, my background professionally was I was an EMT and a nonprofit caseworker, so I did pretty quickly get a sense for uh, the sort of lack of continuing support um, you know, within our system. But really, personally, what kind of propelled me to create Marigold is I'm someone in long-term recovery myself. Um, you know, the sort of testimonials about um, sort of cultural bias, preventing people from um, you know, accessing support and things like that in the sort of um, pre-work before this really resonated for me. Um, and really understand how peer support for me was something that really over the course of years sort of chipped away at an unwillingness to see traditional forms of care um, until finally when I was ready, you know, I could use the, the, that community, the peers I knew um, to really navigate, um, you know, treatment and ultimately achieve recovery successfully. So our mission sort of simply put is to give people agency in their health and recovery. Um, like I said earlier, uh, people might not necessarily identify as just a diagnosis, right, just a substance use or a mental health condition, but people always want to have a better life for their loved ones and their families, and they're always motivated to work towards that. Um, so I have a quote from a member here that really resonates, you know, what comes up for me when I see that pic, so another member posted a picture in a group chat, is that we can do anything together, whether we're feeling up or down. If we're up, we help others. If we're down, reaching for help. So a really core part of our program is having the members support each other in these anonymous group chats. And we are actually not a maternal focused intervention, but the reason we're here is mothers disproportionately engage with our service and find it a safe and welcoming space to talk about all uh, manner of needs and, and request support, as y'all will see. So um, again, like I said, uh, the folks who were preparing this did some, some great work. Our sort of distillation of this, of, of all these needs is, the first point is um, we just struggle with engagement, right? Whether it's um, sort of stigma or lack of physical access, we just don't reach enough people with most interventions to actually impact uh, the sort of population as a whole. Uh, there are perfectly engaging ways that people get support. I mean, yeah, Facebook Marketplace, Reddit, AA, 12 Steps, but these places tend not to be tied into the larger care system and are usually um, even less accessible to women. Uh, and then we don't have really good means for if something is engaging and, and coordinated um, to actually report outcomes back to, um, to the plan slash state, right? To actually look at whether or not it's working because you know we've never actually delivered for this population, right? Like ever. So we're solving a sort of unknown unknown and hopefully the innovation we've seen in this space will actually allow us to drive outcomes. So who is Marigold Health? We are sort of the way to think about Marigold, the two sides of that coin. One side is we are a provider of peer support. We hire certified peers, certified in the state that they uh, reside. Um, we follow existing state performance specifications for peer support, which is usually a covered benefit. Um, and there's a lot more detail I can go into there. Um, but the other side of what we do is in addition to the sort of one-to-one -one coaching, the wellness planning, the stuff you'd expect from a traditional peer support program, we operate this anonymous social network of 24 seven group chats on our mobile app. And anyone who's interested in recovery can download this app and message into these groups, which are moderated by our certified peers. Now, we work with plans on a partnership 
that have three core pillars. The first is um, we are a 24 seven behavioral health support. Um, we have staffing 20, 24 hours, seven days a week. Someone can call us, call our warm line talk to a peer or they can message into a group chat. We are not an SUD or an SMI specific platform. Our peers are trained in a holistic whole person model and we have a range of clinical oversight I could you know, go into um, if anyone is interested in the Q&A. The other core part of our program is we are not hands off. We actually build a local workforce who goes out, builds relationships, um, signs MOUs and BAAs with existing providers, and we use that to generate sort of durable enrollments. And the final piece is, even if we're providing intensive one-to-one -one supports to a certain subpopulation, we're actually gonna get a much broader set of folks to download the Marigold app and message into groups. And we can use the app as a forum to uh, flag needs that people are expressing, um, as well as collect patient reported outcomes, you know, the BARC-10, the PHP-9 forums people are probably familiar with. In terms of how we measure outcomes succinctly, our aim is to, court, is to sort of augment, right, and improve the work of existing providers. So we look to see if engagement in our service leads to sustained engagement in services like dentistry, medication-assisted treatment, outpatient counseling, medication management. And we have partnered with a range of folks across the continuum of care from inpatient behavioral health providers um, to health systems who are looking for additional services um, when they're standing up new behavioral health programs themselves. The only other thing I'll mention is we are unique in that we have a, we also do a lot of workforce development and that many people join our platform to actually learn how to become peers ourselves. Uh, many peers who are not yet certified will actually moderate groups in our platform as a way to get the hours they need uh, towards certification. Now, uh, in terms of the clinical research base, what we're doing um, as the we probably well articulated, peer support has a robust evidence base. Really the problem we're trying to solve at Marigold is how come you know, only like 10, 5% of the people who could benefit from peer support actually get it? So we tried to design this group program with accessibility and retention in mind. So um, the quote you guys can read, we saw very strong retention over a proof of concept study. We're actually running a five-year RCT as a follow-up to this. But in the interest of time, I'd like to direct you to the uh, actual member example. We had a group for co-occurring needs and you can see one member saying, hey, I was feeling this way before I found the app too. I have loved ones, but they either don't get it or it's my boyfriend that I need to vent about and can't vent to. Uh, and then the other person responds with saying, yeah, everyone is so supportive. I swear you start to feel really close. And then they go on and at the end they add, I have schizoaffective borderline personality disorder anxiety and OCD, so totally get it. And I really love this example because it really shows what people are gonna actually open up and share of their own volition if they feel like they're being heard, if they feel like they're being supported effectively. And that first message from that red member talking about right like a relationship that is ultimately the type of thing that, that mothers tend to feel horribly isolated around. So I think as I'll go on, there are some other examples where you'll really see why we've seen the engagement from mothers that we do. Now for the real world data here, uh, I chose some uh, examples from our partnership with AmeriHealth Caritas in Delaware. I chose this because even though it is a substance use focused deployment, it's important to remember that that's really payer speak. The members we dealt with, um, not all of them would agree they had an SUD but all of them would agree they're seeking recovery. Uh, and uh, it was a statewide implementation across rural and um, urban areas. So it felt um, you know, pretty representative of what we were trying to look at here. Uh, the Delaware team that we built locally, you can see a picture of them. Uh, we enrolled members through a combination of direct outreach over the phone and SMS, actually going out to providers and building different referral workflows or just running groups on site uh, and local marketing. So bus stops, small ads, um, that type of thing. Uh, the data here is sort of from our first eight months following launch. So that was last August to the end of Q1. So the first thing, as I've been alluding to, is provider relationships really drive enrollments. Um, one of the core principles of our model is to really try and take advantage of this fact that if you just approach the average person with a peer and you say, hey, I've got this 24-7 app where you can message into a group, if you want to give it a try, we found that 70 to 80 percent of people are actually willing to download the app and give it a shot. So when we went on site to providers, so we went on site to different um, outpatient substance use treatment providers, and um, we were able to sign up a lot of folks for that app in the first month, but there was a sort of virality to it where once patients could see a lot of other members were signing up, um, they would actually start to, to onboard of their own volition and we could use that to better target uh, programming for the groups. So just some other high level stats, right? I mean, in eight months, more than 2000 members uh, engaged and agreed to work with the peer. So what that basically means is they had a two-way meaningful interaction with the peer and they agreed to receive more services and continue to engage with the peers. We don't tell people who said, you know, uh, don't talk to me ever again. 
And engagement in the groups is really tremendous with um, you know, almost 17,000 messages being sent by, by 600 people. Now, what's really kind of interesting here as we kind of go into why is this an effective intervention for mothers, mothers very disproportionately make up our most engaged members. If you were to take the top 20% of members and app members in terms of engagement by messages sent, about 60% of them would be mothers. Um, when I talk to our members, um, they say that safety concerns around accessing AA, NA groups are a big reason. Um, Sigma is also another one. Uh, other, so sort of, you can see here some of the groups we ran, uh, you can read these different themes, I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but you can see they range from some around cultural support, some for folks post-incarceration. These groups are started by our local peers, um, but the two examples I'll really draw your attention to are one from our medication-assisted treatment support group, where you had one member actually giving another member um, guidance, correcting some misinformation, um, that you can actually be on Suboxone while you're pregnant. And what's interesting here is now we do have oversight from a, a, an addiction specialist or chief medical officer, and, and the patients are not giving each other medical advice. But what they're doing is they're talking to each other about their care, addressing stigmas and misconceptions that ultimately empower them to have more conversations with their providers. On the right-hand side, you have an example of what a mother shared in our SMI group, our serious mental illnesses group. And the reason I really like this example is, this is the very first message this member sent into the group chat. All they knew was that it was grouped out of other people who had dealt with a serious mental illness. And right, they start by disclosing uh, a bunch of diagnoses, uh, issues with medication, uh, and that they need a PCP, so there's a lot of actionable needs there. On that note, um, what we have found is that we actually have a very rich source of data because we have members talking about needs in their own sort of native language uh, with, with people who they connect to. So you do find in these chats that people will say, hey, I need a dentist, or hey, I need to see a primary care doctor, or what have you. And in the groups, there's a very sort of special phenomenon that happens when you see that, you know, a given member is going to say, hey, does anyone else know where I can find a dentist? And two, three other members are going to follow up, right, and say they found the same need. So we have proprietary natural language processing technology that runs on these group messages and basically uh, helps pick out actionable information for other members of the care team. So when we detect different uh, topics and groups that are relevant, and we can customize these based on the partner, whether it's um, you know, specific transportation or, or benefits programs or you know, more clinical needs, um, we can then configure those to send automatic emails or SMSs um, to either a planned care navigator or a provider staff. Uh, and what we do is we keep people engaged in these 24 seven groups and immediately as they mentioned the needs that are particularly pressing, um, we then refer them to those other supports. And here's a case study where by doing that, we were actually able to quadruple the number of people who accepted, right, essentially working with the care navigator because the time they touched the care navigator, they had a discrete need that they were interested in solving. The care navigator was actually able to be useful. So on my last slide here, um, we are actively entering new states. Um, we're building a new workforce in every state that we enter. The goal is to be in every state in four months uh, to enter a new state. So Hawaii actually is interesting because we uh, have our first employee in Hawaii, our HR person is based there. But we will hire two to four local peers, basically reflecting the diversity of the population you're trying to target. Um, we'll also define different patient reported outcomes that we're going to get the members to complete in app. And then we will uh, essentially go out and enroll the members in any way we can. And that varies between in-person, digital, um, and sort of individualized outreach channels. But our goal is usually to enroll uh, at least a couple hundred people in the first six months that we follow sort of more intensely and report outcomes on very closely. But any member, regardless of their past utilization, can download the Marigold app to access this 24 seven group support because you're gonna get a lot of people who you didn't know right, expressing different needs in the chats. And then we can refer them to follow and supports as well. So ultimately we partner with plans as a sort of robust member engagement platform with this lived experience. Um, and then we use that to create a sort of durable piece of recovery infrastructure in the community, right? Where oftentimes we partner with other agencies and their peers might be the one who are running groups on our platforms and people can be part of multiple groups and so on. So I know I'm a little bit over, uh, we got like five <laughs> minutes, would love to take questions from folks.